It's Halloween, so I thought I'd read you a little bit of my scary book. Albert hated Friday mornings. It wasn't that his paper round was any harder, and he didn't spend any more time tramping over the wet Derbyshire moors. Though the winter chill seemed particularly harsh this morning, it had been getting steadily worse all December, that was nothing compared to the clutching in his stomach. Friday was the day he delivered the papers to Cragtop. Albert's round was long. Sometimes, if he was lucky, his father, who owned the general store, took pity on him and ordered his brother to help. On those days, he could be finished in time to get to Mrs. Lean Lane's reading lessons in the church school. Even on the slowest rounds, when he dangled his 11-year-old legs into the brook for an hour, or took a mug of tea with Thomas the Shepherd, he'd still be back in time to join his friends on the school wall at break time. There, they would talk in excited voices about the war, how they would join up and beat their way to Germany. We'll teach the Kaiser, his friend Harry had said yesterday, then gone on to tell the boys exactly how. Mrs Lane eventually came out to see what all the laughing had been about, scolding them, telling them they sounded like monkeys. Albert hadn't been laughing, though. He'd already realised that Friday was just around the corner, and his feet felt like lead weights. Now Friday was here, Albert just wanted it to be over. He took his bag pulled his coat over a thick jumper and crashed out into the winter morning. He sped through the first part of the round, pushing papers with careless determination through people's doors, his feet turning almost before the flap snapped shut. When the bag was finally empty, trying not to think too much, he raced back to the shop. It was only when he found himself staring at the irregular pile of papers for Cragtop House that his butterflies returned. Thankfully, Cragtop didn't take a daily paper but the Friday delivery filled a whole bag. There would be about 40 items, sometimes many more. The delivery was made up of such a variety of papers, magazines and more that Albert often found himself stopping to look as he packed them. Some were regulars. From Fleet Street came every issue of the Times. From Scotland came the Herald, Monday, Wednesday and Friday. From Manchester, the Manchester City News. Occasionally, the front pages of these newspapers, with stories of the situation in Europe, caught his attention, but he was too jittery to stay distracted for long. Along with the Nationals, there were many local papers, with articles about lads joining up, gossip about members of the parish, and notices that surely had meaning to no one but the people who lived there. Albert had often wondered what it was that made these papers so interesting to the solitary owner of Cragtop. However, it was the odd assortment of magazines and pamphlets that unnerved him. Each week there would be a handful their subject matter hinting at mysterious things quite out of place with Albert's world. Archaeological journals detailed discoveries of ancient tombs, badly printed newsletters from obscure societies, with articles that were even stranger. Some were so worn by their journeys that they were falling apart. Most Albert couldn't open, as they were sealed in brown paper, but many of these had the name of the sender on their reverse. Even the names seemed scary. The Society of Light from the Silver Dagger, Journal of the Flowered Knife. They made him think about the folk tales that he'd occasionally heard from the old men of the village. Once in late November, a small white booklet had arrived that was not in an envelope. Instead, the pages were glued together, needing a paper knife to separate them. The booklet's title was fixed on the front cover, just below an address label, on controlling fiends and monsters. He'd shown his father, who had smirked and cuffed him on the back of the head. All that mattered as far as his father was concerned was that a man paid his bills and kept a civil tongue in his head. There, the master of Cragtop was faultless. Albert glanced across at his father as he stuffed the last of the papers into the bag. The stern-faced man was busy with an early customer. It wouldn't do to be here when he was done. His father was very free with his cuffs. Albert pulled the bag up onto his shoulder and headed out into the cold. He turned left and began to trudge through the snow towards the outskirts of the village. He didn't know much about the owner. Cragtop was perched high on the rocks a few miles from the village. It always seemed to attract strangers. Like his predecessors, the current owner had been the subject of village gossip when he first arrived in 1911. He lived alone apart from an elderly manservant and made no attempt to befriend the locals in three years since. There had been wild stories about him from the villagers. I hear he mined in Africa, Thomas had said, buying tobacco from the crowded shop one morning. Got rich on diamonds from land he stole from the Boers. He's the mark of a slave trader, if you ask me, 
Old Clement replied. Old Clem had once been to sea, and so considered himself an authority on most things beyond the village. It's in the eyes. I saw him all over in the old days. Audible buggers. Like anything fresh, though, eventually he'd become old news, and the villagers had found other things to talk about. On the rare occasions he was seen in the village, people would nod politely and perhaps say they saw him, but other than that, no one much cared. Albert thought differently, though. The owner of Cragtop was a wizard. Albert lingered by the entrance of Cragtop, summoning the courage to walk through the rusty iron gates. From the gates there was a half-mile walk through a steep-sided valley. If those gates closed behind him, Albert knew he was trapped. Nothing, not the nagging weight of the bag, nor even the dirty sleet soaking through his coat and chilling him so much it was hard to breathe, would make him take another step until he was ready. From here everything became a tried and tested plan, that he'd used and constantly improved since he first delivered to Cragtop. The plan had a simple goal, to be in and out of the grounds in the shortest amount of time and draw as little attention there as possible. That way he would be as safe as he could be, though he didn't think that was very safe at all. He closed his eyes and muttered a few words of encouragement to himself, then he started forward through the gateway. Tall trees grew tightly together, struggling for the light, before the sides of the valley climbed too high and cast the grounds beyond into shadow. Branches crept over the driveway, creating a gloomy tunnel that bent around to the west. Albert followed the bend, walking briskly and keeping tight to where the light was dimmest and he felt least exposed. A single bird whistled a lonely song in an otherwise silent wood. Animals seemed to shy away from this place. Albert had seen no signs of life here. In fact, the only thing he had once seen was the body of a cat, just in from the gates. It had been stretched out with its paws up, as if trying to ward off something, its eyes wide open with terror. He'd bent and looked, but had been unable to see any reason for the cat to be dead. Beyond, the drive opened up into a slim valley. Grass grew in thick clumps and occasional heathers sprouted up. At the far end, the valley began to rise towards the second copse. Above the trees, Cragtop lurched into the grey morning. The angles of its tall, rock-built chimneys and high-arched windows gave it the constant feel it was about to crash to the ground. The whole building just looked precarious. Dark stone carvings of lions and wolves clung to the walls, shadowing the doors and windows they surrounded. From one side of the house a cold, moss-covered wall ran out to the ruins of an outhouse, a grim shell with a caved-in roof that could hide all sorts of dangers. Albert had never gone near it. He crept out from the hood of trees into the valley and quickened his step, fixing his eyes firmly on the drive in the distance. He knew that if he picked up his pace he could get across, leave the papers and be back by the entrance in less than five minutes. Even in the brief time he'd been under the trees, the morning had darkened. The drops of sleet had become fatter and colder, turning to snow. He pulled the collar of his sopping coat tighter with his free arm and pushed on across the grass, his heart pounding. As he marched, he began to recite under his breath in a hollow, reedy voice. Her eyes were as bright as they were the first night, when we danced to an old-fashioned tune. In a dusty old schoolhouse on Saturday night, how we laughed as we waltzed round the room. The song always made him feel better. He knew that if he marched in time, he would have delivered the post after the fourth time he'd sung it. He came from the valleys to the dark city alleys to care for the young and the poor, and me a young soldier with medals galore that I'd won in the African war. He sang the rest of it as he tramped over the grass. The wind rocked the trees audibly. It whistled against his ears, making his voice sound very small. He reached the end of the song, counted eight steps in his head, then began again, clicking wet fingers to mark the time. He reached the far end of the drive by the end of his third recitation and began to feel some relief. He was getting close to the house. He began again. Her eyes were as bright as... Then he saw them. There were three of them standing off by the furthest trees to his right, just where the valley side began to rise sharply. They stood motionless, watching. Two were men in simple white shirts that were soaked to the skin, not that they seemed to have noticed. The third was a woman, a step or two ahead of the others, one leg tensed as if ready to spring forward and rush him. The woman was the clearest to him. Weathered skin stretched painfully over a bony face that looked desperately hungry. Her eyes bore straight into him, her mouth seemed to hang open as if she was trying to suck in his scent and taste it on her tongue. Her face seemed somehow wrong, too pinched up and sharp to be entirely human. Albert remembered the title of the pamphlet, Controlling Fiends and Monsters, 
and a rush of adrenaline pumped into his body, making his arms and legs tingle. The woman took a step forward. One of the men reached behind her, reached out and grabbed her arm, yanking her back. She snarled at him, but didn't try to free herself. After a moment, all three of them turned and walked into the darkness of the woods. The woman looked back, once, just before she disappeared. Albert gasped, suddenly rooted to the spot. He thought about dropping the papers where he stood and leaving, but if there was a complaint to his father, he'd be beaten so hard he wouldn't be able to sit on the wooden school seats for a week. That prospect forced him to be brave. He willed his legs onward up the drive, wiping away tears of fear. A person in the trees could get from where those three had been to the house almost without being seen at all. Albert picked up his pace until he was nearly running. His eyes stayed firmly on the trees. He was ready to drop his burden at any time and turn for home. The canvas bag swung heavily, threatening to overbalance him, so he loped along, the effort he was making out of all proportion with the speed he was going. Finally he reached the porch. He gripped on the bell rope and pulled hard three times. Somewhere, deep in the house, a bell rang. Albert began to pull out the papers, dumping them in a messy pile on the doorstep. He stole desperate glances into the woods. Nothing seemed to be approaching. The papers took ages to pull from the bag. Eventually they were all on the pile. All that remained was to be sure that someone was coming to get them. Albert listened at the door, shifting his weight from one foot to the other. He strained his ears to hear for a creak of a floorboard that would tell him he could escape. Boy! A whisper that sounded like tearing paper froze him. He turned back into the dingy woods. A short distance beyond the tree line, three figures crept towards him, black silhouettes against a grey background. Boy! The voice repeated, all silk and poison. Boy, come to us! Albert's legs were jelly. His feet below felt glued to the ground. He stared into the woods. The creatures began to edge nearer. A tiny voice in the back of his head was calling out to him, reminding him about something, but he couldn't for the life of him make it out. All he could focus on were the dark shadows growing closer to the edge of the trees. There was a sudden click. The entrance to Cragtop unlatched. At the noise, the three figures in the wood shrank back and disappeared. Albert gasped aloud, his senses coming back to him. Run! That's what the little voice had been saying. Run! Albert grabbed his discarded badge from the porch, and summoning all the strength his young legs could muster, he raced back down the drive. As he ran, crashes and cracks of wood being crushed underfoot followed him from within the trees. He shot a look into the darkness and caught a brief glimpse of three shapes racing along at the side of him. Then he burst into the valley, leaving the woods and house behind. He didn't dare look back as he tore across the grass. When he reached the comparative safety of the great gates, he stopped and glanced back. Everything was still again. He leaned forward, resting his weight on a tree trunk and struggled to catch his breath. Now what did you see to make you so scared? A thin hand with long, elegant fingers clamped onto his shoulder and pulled him around. Albert stared up into the cold, merciless face of the master of Cragtop. Eyes with irises so dark they were almost black bore into him. He came nearer. Albert could feel hot breath on his face. Answer me, boy. Then Albert knew he was doomed. With a sob, he screwed his eyes shut, fear making him wet himself. It ran down his leg onto the slush below, blossoming into a little yellow puddle. The man looked at the puddle and shoved Albert away from him. He fell into the road and bashed his head on the rough stone. Blood dripped into his eyes, stinging them and making it hard to see. He raised his arms to ward off bros, whimpering, but none came. Your father will hear about this, boy. I imagine you'll be soundly beaten. The pitiless voice was further away now. Albert looked up, wiping blood from his eyes. The master of Cragtop stood looking back at him, his angular face unmoved. Then he turned as if he'd lost interest and walked off into his grounds. A black walking stick clicked by his side as he took full, confident strides. His long coat, which reached from his bony shoulders to the ground, dragged through the sludge underfoot. He disappeared around the bend in the track without turning back again. Albert sobbed with relief. A beating from his father, though painful, was suddenly preferable to any of the other fears that turned around in his mind. As the click of the cane quietened into the distance, he clambered to his feet and limped away towards the village. Happy Halloween. My name's John Scotcher. I've just been reading an extract from my novel, The Boy in Winter's Grasp, which is available from Fantastic Books. Uh, their website is fantasticbookstore.com. It's also available on amazon.co.uk and .com. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you get a copy. Thank you.